So let's this afternoon we're going to hear a session that's headed by Jorn uh, and Brian and James and I think other people too. Uh, we've got some fantastic guest speakers and we're looking at sustainability, so about safe and sustainable settlements. So Jorn, over to you. Well, uh, connectivity was a challenge. I uh, had to steal two of the vocals or one vocal from each name and re-register and uh, sneak in from a very private email account to actually be able to join ourselves and you right now. But uh, connectivity is increasingly important and uh, we need to find better ways of uh, adapting programs to this. And we will uh, explore digital solutions uh, supporting programming and we will also go into energy and thereby clean energy as an enabler of uh, programming and uh, uh, action uh, in urban areas uh, which i'm very much looking forward to and then um, sustainability is the foundation of uh, of durable solutions so um, as I see it, uh, displaced donors and the world demands sustainability and they demand your uh, attention uh, in this, um, in this uh, session. Uh, so I will share screen, but that will stop others, parti other participants' computer sound, which I'm quite happy with for a short while. Uh, and there. There we are. Um, COVID has um, clearly showed how we are all connected and uh, how we're part of nature and the environment. Uh, the, the global climate crisis uh, and new patterns of displacement following it and other changes demands new solutions and uh, responses which are environmental friendly and sustainable and safe for people. Uh, in the work group on uh, sustainability, clean energy and connectivity, we are continuing to work with different stakeholders, uh, sorting out what kind of programming will be needed to support our ambitions and uh, also to see what kind of relations we would have to private partners, uh, <clears throat> uh, providers of, uh, uh, of uh, energy and also household energy solutions. Uh, where are the most challenging areas? Would it be uh, household cooking? Would it be uh, access to um, charging? Would it be uh, and and what are the different synergies we see within this area? Uh, big humanitarian operations are interesting to look into because there are so many uh, different um, angles to address the challenges of sustainability. Uh, and um, I believe that uh, if we link this to uh, the ambitions of the sustainable development goals, we see that energy is to a very large extent an enabler of all the different goals. It uh, helps uh, water provision, it uh, is core to education and um, the safe through communities and uh, livelihood opportunities and so on. Um, and to dive into this, uh, the different agencies have recently uh, been uh, engaging more and more in this. In uh, NRC we have a lot of work groups uh, engaging in uh, 
greening the orange and supporting the UN agencies and so on. Uh, I must say that, uh, as you see from this slide, Nina has been uh, advocating for this for years, and I have been advocating for this for years. But uh, now we are surfing on uh, the Greta Thunberg wave, and the resonance has become a little bit stronger which allows us to engage deeper into this kind of programming. And, uh, and that's something I truly cherish. Uh, and um, let's hear a couple of words from uh, Brian and James. Should we ask uh, IOM is on the left side, maybe Brian, you would like to give a quick uh, sum up of uh, policies and ambition on the IOM side. Sure. Thanks, Jorn. Um, for this, I'll, I'll take off my cluster hat and put on my uh, IOM hat. Uh, I want to just briefly mention some uh, energy and sustainability initiatives that IOM have been involved with recently. Uh, many of you in the in the chat call will be very familiar with a lot of them in your context, so feel free to discuss them or um, explain them further in the chat. As Jorn was describing, energy and sustainability is very cross-cutting and not the sole remit of a single sector or an agency. Um, many of them are done in collaborate. Many, many of these in initiatives are done in collaboration with other partners or sectors. So apologies in advance if I forget to explicitly mention any of them. Um, one initiative that has happened since our last retreat was a study on solid waste management in IDP sites in West and Central Africa. Um, I'll include the study in the meeting notes or in the in the chat, uh, but basically it explore, explored uh, regional practices, uh, looked at a framework for solid management and provided some recommended practices based on these local and, and global uh, practices. Um, the approach, um, yeah, the approach or recommendations might be interesting for some of the other contexts that, that you work in. Uh, two examples from Malakal in South Sudan were the uh, solarization of the humanitarian hub there and the uh, production of energy from a biodigestion system. Uh, details of uh, them can be found in the recent uh, ECHO compendium of good practices for a greener humanitarian response. I'll share a link to that as well. Um, Lastly, from, from the field as well, uh, from Bangladesh, there have been uh, initiatives on installing solar powered borehole pumps uh, that was done in, with support from Japan. And uh, there was also a collaboration with FAO and WFP uh, called the SAFE Project um, with multiple environmental components, such as uh, the provision of uh, uh, LPG canisters to uh, reduce firewood consumption and deforestation, as well as a uh, tree, pla uh, tree planting project. Um, at the HQ level, finally, uh, with the support of NORCAP uh, consultants, there is work um, currently ongoing uh, to include an energy component in the uh, DTM multi-sector location assessments. Um, it's, it's done in line with the um, work done by the GPA and UNHCR on energy indicators. And uh, it'll be looking, it's looking at gathering uh, indicators on cooking, electricity and, and space, uh, space heating and cooling. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's some of, uh, some of a sample of some of the initiatives I've come across over the while. And um, if others have other examples, feel free to um, put them in the chat and ask any uh, questions you have about these, uh, if they're relevant, perhaps for, for other contexts as well. Um, over to you, Jorn. Yeah, great, thanks. And uh, James, would you like to give your update when you also will be uh, doing the presentation of the empirical examples from uh, UNHCR? Um, okay, actually, that will be my colleague Emmanuel doing that one, the, the actual um, the actual presentation. But then I can maybe just talk a little about what some of the work we're doing. Um, Essentially, as we mentioned, yes, energy is definitely one of the really strong entry points for UNHCR at this point in time in terms of um, in terms of our in interventions at very, in various operations. And that in line with that, we have launched um, recently the, the Global Energy Strategy, which Brian in, uh, touched on just, uh, just a little in terms of some of the interventions we're looking at, community facilities, in terms of looking at um, 
electrification, electricity for both um, persons of concern vis-a-vis -vis the, the other shared facilities, um, and also then look at issues um, relating to the connectivity component, as you mentioned, that is communicating with communities, um, as well as the sustainability aspect. So within the sustainability component, we are basically looking at, uh, from a global perspective, thinking of going with um, how we can begin to green some of the responses. So this this in itself is very opportune from even from, from the cluster um, perspective in terms of seeing how we can actually begin to green both our, our refugee camps, but even then non-camp non situations, which in itself would then lend um, to the environmental sustainability um, component, which is part of this working group, but then also look at the social as well as the economic components of sustainability. And in line with the SDGs, as you've outlined them here, SDG 7 on energy, SDG, SDG 13 on climate action. Um, these are some of the components we are basically working on. Um, examples of that would include some work we're doing um, in Ethiopia, more so um, with quite a focus on cooking energy, which is, which will be probably the the the, the basis of the, the ongoing discussions for some one of our presentations, whereby they have a very they had a particularly in innovative approach to tackling um, an invasive species um, uh, challenge they had, Prosopis uliflora is an invasive species which tends to, to actually colonize a particular area. Once it grows, it colonizes and kills off all biodiversity in that particular area. What that particular project did is it, it took the Prosopis itself, and then based on that, they're actually using the Prosopis to, to actually produce briquettes in terms of providing cooking energy for the communities in that particular area of Melkadida. So, um, so some innovation in terms of uh, then you know the tackling how how do we then look at nature vis-a-vis -vis, um, some some um, intervention in terms of how it can, how we can benefit our persons of concern going forward. Um, so essentially, these are some of the aspects we're looking at and the in the course of the of this session. And now a number of other issues will come come to the fore. So thank you very much. Looking forward to that. Thanks a lot. And. Um... Our first uh, speakers are Sinne Bergby and Ida Lin, directly from the launch of their urban recovery framework in, uh, in Beirut. Uh, and uh, targeting the challenges of the shocks in urban areas and uh, clean energy solution in urban responses. Uh, I'm thinking that the CCCM should be where 70% of the refugees and IDPs reside to stay relevant in the years ahead. Uh, let's hear what uh, the focus of Urban A and uh, uh, Ida, who is their head of analysis and uh, urban economist, uh, and Sinne, who combines uh, urban planning background with a lot of uh, experience in field operations and coordination uh, can uh, guide us through the energy questions in uh, urban displacement responses. Sinne, would you like me to uh, share the presentation or do you want to control it yourself? I suppose uh, alternative B is uh, uh, what you prefer. Yeah, Jan, I think uh, if we can share it ourselves. Uh, voila, then uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let's see if I can do this. There, can you see my full screen now? No, we see the right, uh, the right column of uh, alternatives in the PDF. That was not my intention, sorry. <laughs> Let's see.
It is not popping up as it should, so perhaps you could uh, take away the right column uh, on the arrow and uh, do it from the PDF view. E yes, am I? So sorry. Do you have it on your end? Let's see. F five to present. Um. Sorry, first the technical issues to even get into the session, and now I'm not able to share the screen. Let's see. <laughs> okay. Um, if then I do the sharing. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. Share screen. This will stop others. Yes. And there we are. And then uh, view full screen. That should uh, do it. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Jan. And thank you for inviting us to share some of the Study on. Ada, your sound is a little bit um, cracking. Hmm. It's not the day for technical. Um, <laughs> let's see. Sorry. When you are exploring urban shocks, uh, then uh, you will also have to expect some challenges on the technic technical side. I can start is while Ida is moving, maybe, or did you find a place? So the, the study we conducted for NordCup is based on uh, a report that was uh, uh, developed by NordCup and Boston Consulting Group last year, or beginning of this year, um, which focused more on the, yes, Jörn is holding it up. Um, uh, which was focused more on camp settings and rural areas. So given that NordCup is increasingly focusing as well, or forced to focus in, in uh, on urban response, as you alluded to, um, they, they also wanted to have kind of an urban lens to that analysis and, and therefore uh, contracted us to, to look at an, um, clean energy opportunities and challenges in urban crisis settings. Um, and uh, I'll give the floor to Ida to elaborate further. And um, say when I should flip. That's good. Can you hear me now? Very well. Great. Okay. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, Yes, so as Suna mentioned, um, we're doing this, we did this study for NORCAP, given that uh, there is what we call an urban shift, where we see rapid urbanization, we see more and more migrants and displaced people taking on um, arriving in cities, and we see a growing share of humanitarian crises that are unfolding in cities, which means that actors like NORCAP are increasingly also working within complex urban crisis and within cities with pre-existing systems, governance structures and overlapping vulnerabilities as you all know. Jan, if you could switch for me. So in the study to try and unpack what this means, we use that three tiered lens to look at consideration for clean energy supply from a national through a city to a neighborhood or a local level. So on the national level, we looked primarily at, <clears throat> excuse me, political and regulatory environment. On a city level, we look more at systems and value chains. And on a local level, we focus more on the needs and vulnerabilities of people. Mm, and, <clears throat> excuse me, just a second. Uh, 
And this is particularly um, given the high inequalities in cities where some neighborhoods have um, uh, relatively less access to, for example, services, infrastructure, housing or adequate housing and jobs and so on. So really trying to understand what that means and how that links through these levels to the systems on a city scale and up to the national level. Next slide, please. For our study, we looked at three different cases, Syria, Lebanon, and Kenya. And in all three cases, uh, we, we do have ongoing work. So we've been drawing on that as well as doing desk reviews. And also in Kenya, we did two, we uh, collected data in two neighborhoods in, in Nairobi. So as this uh, diagram shows, in Syria, we work predominantly on the national level, looking at the policies and regulatory systems. In Lebanon, as Jan said, we just came back from Lebanon, uh, Beirut. Uh, we have tried to draw on both the national city and neighborhood level in, in understanding what that means in terms of access and provision of energy. And then on the, in Kenya, we looked more than on the neighborhood level, drawing on the data that we collected through the study. Next. So the three cases have some similarities or some overlapping challenges and issues and uh, resources, but also ways in which they differ quite a bit. So we try to not compare, but have a transnational uh, baseline or, or, or um, data base so we could explore these different levels. For example, in Kenya, the energy mix is predominantly from renewable energy with almost 80% coming from renewables. In Lebanon and Syria, on the other hand, it's predominantly from fossil fuel or almost exclusively actually. Looking at the displacement situation in Kenya, there is about 65,000 refugees in the country and 15% live in Nairobi approximately and refugees are not allowed to work or settle outside the camps. Uh, in Lebanon, on the other hand, the government enforced a no camp policy after the Syrian refugee crisis started in 2011, which means that a lot of refugees live in informal areas or through in different areas of, of the country and particularly in the cities. Um, there's an estimated 1.7 million Syrian and Palestinian refugees in Lebanon with about one quarter uh, living in Beirut. In Syria, we have 6.6 uh, .6 million refugees who has left the country and approximately the same amount of internally displaced still living within the country. If we look at the access to electricity in Kenya, it's said to be 100% but still the reliability and the quality of electricity, it varies quite a bit. And also whether the connections are through legal or illegal connections to the grid. Uh, if we look at Lebanon, already before the explosion in August of last year, the, the hours of access to electricity in a day really went down from about 21 to four hours in Beirut. And now it's even worse. And this is also driven by the lack of fuel. Uh, and in Syria, the situation is similar and there's about typically three to four hours per day where people have access to electricity. Uh, I think we go to the next slide. Hmm. So based on our study and these three examples, we came up with, or we, we put together quite a few challenges on these different levels that we think are important to highlight. I won't get, go through everyone in very much detail, but we'll, we'll focus on the local neighborhood level, which I think might be most interesting for you. Next. And we will make the reports available in time. <laughs> of course. So what are some of the main challenges
there's also an issue of inefficient energy use in residential buildings. And this is partially due to construction materials and the lack of maintenance of buildings. When we look at the consequences of not having access to reliable energy, that includes, for example, unsafe streets and public spaces, and also dangerous power connections, um, for example, wires that are coming across the streets uh, and uh, also people using um, cut off wires to heat their pot of water and so on. This increases protection risks, uh, including attacks, harassments and injuries. Lack of access to electricity also reduces the opportunities to study, especially for girls. Um, it reduces productivity and economic activities. It reduces food security as you don't necessarily have the opportunity to preserve food or transport it across distances. Um, there's the problem of unclean cooking solutions. Um, people and particularly women have to allocate more time to drudgery uh, tasks. And then there's the impediments to successfully introduce new energy solutions. And that includes uh, cultural barriers to uptake of new technologies, such as preferences for the ones that the solutions that we already know, um, as well as um, not being familiar or have knowledge of new technologies. Um, the challenge that when access to electricity increases, people's uh, demand and use of electricity also changes. So the solution you need today might not be the one you need when you have more access already. And also the upfront cost of uh, investments, particularly for solar solutions, um, where financing options might be limited and investment risks are high. Next. In Nairobi, in the two neighborhoods that we looked at, um, we found that energy consumption at home was primarily through formal connections to the grid. So 61% of the respondents had formal connections, which left 39% uh, who didn't have formal connections or who didn't know what kind of connections they had. Uh, a large share of those, 43%, had this arrangement of informal connecting through their landlord. 26% um, had through pre or post paid meters and 28% um, through an agent. We also saw that about 5% were not connected at all to the power grid. Um, and those respondents rely on paraffin um, or in two cases, also solar power. Uh, next. So, solar power users in total made up, um, yes, 2%, as I said, uh, who had that as their primary source, and 16% who uses solar in some way, and also 28% knew or were familiar with solar technology. We also looked at energy consumption in the workplace to understand better how what people actually need electricity for in these areas. Uh, and it's predominantly for lighting, 82%. 40% also needed electricity for charging devices in addition to lighting, and 18% also for food preparation and so on. Uh, next slide, please. When we looked at uh, Beirut, there's no uh, available recent data on this, but this data is from UN Habitat and UNICEF and Relief Center's data collection from 2017 to 2020, uh, looking at disadvantaged neighborhoods in Beirut city. And it's interesting to see the variance in both which how many buildings are connected with critical defects to the public grid. Also how many 
or how big a share of streets do not have street lightning. Mm. So we see with the connection with critical defects, it goes from more than 50% down to only 3% in, in uh, or four and three and two neighborhoods. And with uh, the recent shocks in Beirut, the situation is presumably much, much more severe now. Next. Next, sir. To a little bit more quickly go over some of the challenges uh, that we identified on the city and national level. They include uh, city governance challenges. So one is the lack of a shared understanding of energy access, what that really means, and, 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 and therefore also how you can solve uh, problems with lack of access as well as the multitude of actors who are already benefiting from existing setups or systems makes it very hard to change. Then, as you know, the transmission distribution networks are often of qual uh, poor quality and overloaded. Uh, there's also the issue of the low lifespan and poor afterlife management of solar solutions, which is continuously being refined and uh, improved, but it's still um, quite a big challenge. There's also a big issue around land governance, especially in many of these informal areas of cities uh, where a lot of the, the um, displaced migrants live. Uh, and that includes dis disputes over land rights, precarious tenure and threat of development of informal areas and, and what that means. Um, then linked to the multitude of actors, there's also um, oftentimes parallel systems for energy provision. And there's also the challenge many times for actors to advance from piloting solutions to actually scale them up. Mm -hmm. And then we have challenges that are linked to not having access to electricity and energy, for example, limited or non-operational water pumping, uh, public health and provision of healthcare uh, services, and so on. On a national level, uh, looking at the political and regulatory environments, one major challenge is weak, uh, weak legal frameworks, regulatory hurdles, and or rapidly changing regulatory environments. <laughs> Um, there's also uh, complex decision making and power structures and that markets are not economically viable for private providers of clean energy. Um, next. So the question is, what does this mean and, and what can we, <laughs> where, where do we start? Um, next slide, please. So we put together uh, principles and considerations that we believe can be useful to guide energy related interventions. On a neighborhood level, this can include or should include uh, to base the design and implementation on evidence and contextual understanding of interlinked needs systems practices of formal and informal service provision and governance. So that's easier said than done, particularly given the lack of data and information that's all, uh, often uh, a big issue in urban areas. But one way to start that is through involving people, uh, using people-centered and community-led initiatives. Um, this also um, will probably increase the uptake of new solutions. We also suggest to find anchor, uh, anchor clients for solar PV systems and explore solutions to sell back access electricity to the grid, as well as expansion of local provision to industries. Um, 
then it's the potential in exploring mobile renewable and energy sources. And this is particularly interesting, we believe, in places with high fluidity in the population um, and places subject to redevelopment plans and or regulations that where you cannot accommodate mini grids or connecting to the main grid. So many places where the government might be reluctant to implement large uh, infrastructure schemes because of the, the land governance issues, these type of solutions might be uh, appropriate also in an urban setting. Mm -hmm. Then it's the potential in using electricity access to leverage uh, or to address other challenges, including precarious tenure. We've seen examples where um, land lords have gotten uh, installed solar panel, for example, in exchange for hosting uh, displaced persons for, an, for over a period of time, for example, which Sina can talk more about from Lebanon, for instance. Um, then it's to identify and seek to mitigate cultural barriers to implement clean energy solutions and to improve and streamline assessments to capture the impact of clean energy solutions because there is still a lot of information lacking on, on what is done today and what could be done. Next. Uh, to quickly again just uh, touch upon some of the principles and considerations on the city and national level. And again, really linking, of course, these different levels, uh, even if you're working on the neighborhood level, the, the way in which you can work with the systems and potentially take advantage of uh, value chains. And of course, uh, um, being um, um, yeah, also, uh, you're also depending on the policy and regulatory environment, of course, on a national level. So strengthening value chains and looking at rural urban market linkages is key also in terms of electricity. Anchor at the local government level, analyze and segregate the market to reach different population groups through different channels instead of applying the same solution for everything or for every person. Um, and integrate energy solutions and redevelopment processes. On the national level, also to look at de-risking investments and move towards finance-oriented marketing, use policy and regulatory permits uh, to limit corruption to digitalize the energy markets, to scale up solution based on financial, environmental viability and sustainability, incorporate sustainable energy access to displaced people uh, through international, national and agency agendas, and to encourage where possible to incorporate new technology and innovation through legislation and incentives. That was a very brief and <laughs> probably mm -hmm quick uh, run through of what we did in this study and, and I hope perhaps we can come back to some of the points in the discussion. Thanks a lot, very interesting and um, uh, Sinna, are you uh, saving your uh, bits for the discussion or are you uh, giving us an update from Lebanon now? I think, I mean, so it has covered, I mean, the, the kind of the, the quick presentation we had today, but I think some of the coming back from Lebanon in the current crisis setting, um, we continuously talk about what, what does urban response mean and, and at what level should you address the challenges. And of course, in working in the humanitarian system, we are focused on the individuals, which is, of course, very much uh, correct, but then you come to Beirut currently and and the city is all dark, right? There is no light. We were walking past this massive solar snake uh, that was implemented on the Beirut River and it, the whole city was dark and you have this massive solar power system. 
uh, it's attached to the grid or linked to the grid. Uh, and somehow uh, it is really, really challenging to see uh, kind of any benefits from those kind of interventions in the current situation. That doesn't mean that it doesn't help, um, but that means that we're also constantly talking about that uh, when we when we talk about the three levels, the reason for that is that we're trying to see if you have a, a certain amount of money to invest in urban response, where do you get the most value for those money? Is it to invest at the household level or is it to invest in the systems? And I think we often come back to the, the fact that in these kind of urban settings and these kind of urban crisis settings, we really need to Put attention to understand the local systems and, and as Ida explained the contexts are quite different from from Lebanon to Syria to to Nairobi but some of those um, readily available solutions to uh, to to work on clean energy in the humanitarian setting doesn't really fit to these these contexts uh, there are examples uh, as mentioned on Kind of uh, sub city level or off grid solutions, where I mean, one example that we looked at outside this is, is also in Yemen, where there has been established a mini grid solution operated by a cooperative of women and they sell energy to, to, the, to the neighborhood which, in which they live. So, there are kind of opportunities to link this to livelihoods as well, and that is potentially where some of our kind of key attention has been now again linked to the situation in Beirut is that we, we see that energy is, is such a you know, key, key enabler to economic recovery uh, and to um, provide abilities, I mean, both for return uh, perspectives as well as uh, recovery at the, at the system level, but also for households that they need access to energy to be able to, to kind of uh, recover their livelihoods. And, and that is really kind of a, a key focus that we had in our discussions that what does that mean? That means that you need to work at the systems level as well. Uh, so that would be interesting for us to hear what the CCCM cluster have of reflections on that. Uh, no, I look that's... very much forward to that because we will also be dealing with the, the levels of responses uh, in tomorrow's uh, strategic messages uh, session. But uh, I think today I would like the audience to uh, think from the angle of CCM operations and uh, area-based uh, operations and see what do we want the future to hold? Uh, and um, that perhaps is bridging over to James and UNHCR and then we will get back to some of your reflections on the audience input and, and I hopefully also wish list for what standards can we set for uh, including uh, energy and sustainable uh, ambitions in programming in the years ahead? Uh, so, James, then I will uh, flip the PowerPoint, but you will introduce UNHCR. Yes, Jon, thank you very much. I'll just very brief in terms of just an overview um, of UNHCR's role in IDP settings in brief. Um, which is material I'm sure everyone is actually fully aware of, but I just thought I'd, I'd just bring it in before then I, we go into the next presentation of um, which my colleague will present. Yeah, um, we need to be quick because we want yes. the time for uh, the audience. And absolutely, yeah, I'll go into the next one. So essentially, um, so really just as I mentioned, really um, the as was mentioned by by uh, previous uh, the previous presentations, really really good presentations, um, the energy component, um, then that is looking more at lighting and uh, lighting and electric electricity. Um, essentially, we would also we also then look at cooking energy, which in itself is I think a very um, is a very contentious issue in terms of the and I noted one of the aspects that was mentioned by Ida was that because of the fact that there is very poor connectivity in, ter in terms of um, um, to the electrical grid or otherwise, a lot of deforestation has actually taken place, which then means a lot of the inhabitants uh, take, are actually turning to, to, to um, biomass energy. 
and that in itself brings in other issues um, with regards to peaceful coexistence with the host community as well as even other other issues related to even government and local government um, um, animosity growing towards this 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 um, displaced population. So in essence within our our interventions we look more a, a lot at the protection through the protection lens what interventions can we then bring in such that the protection is at the core of that um both within both within the cccm as well as then within the global shelter um cluster and this in itself um brings to the fore the uh, the significance of this particular working group in terms of trying to bridge all those elements of energy um, uh, connectivity and sustainability. How do we bring all that together such that we have, a more we have a very holistic sort of intervention that touches on all these aspects and then at the center of that is the protection mandate of UNHCR. So essentially, Jion, that's my, my spiel for now. Thank you. And then I think we were. The, I think the next presentation was the one by um, Emmanuel. Is that is that the case, Sion? Based on our, and that, yeah, that just so, sort of talks about the various aspect community-based protection. You can go into the next one. I, I just mentioned all that in a nutshell. Yep, and then go into the very last one. Um, yeah, whereby yeah, that's yeah, it. Sorry. Yeah, that last one actually, whereby it just says access to clean and safe energy, the promotion of connectivity for improved communication, and the promotion of sustainability in operations ensures accountability to affected populations, a minimization of the carbon footprint of our operations whilst contributing to the health and well being of our persons of concern. So, this is really the core of, of, uh, of the working group from the perspective of area based approaches, as was mentioned by Ion. And um, in that regard, this, this is some of the work that we're trying to do, borrowing also quite a few quite a bit from the, the work uh, within our refugee operations with a view to actually designing fit for purpose interventions that can positively contribute to targeted objectives within IDP settings and then within the, and then the CCCM aspects as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um... seasoned uh, shelter and settlements advisor with the uh, broad field experience and uh, is also an architect and urban planner uh, who's uh, formerly led the IFRC shelter uh, research unit and uh, co-founded the, the shelter center. Uh, she is targeting some of the broader sustainability challenges and uh, including digital uh, ambitions with um, adapting humanitarian operations to circular economy and uh, and thereby also humanitarian action by bridging knowledge uh, creation with academia and um, and uh, private partners and uh, i guess she agrees with me that there is no waste. Uh, over to you, Antonella. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Jor, for the introduction and for inviting me to this session. Uh, can you see the screen at the moment? Because I'm not yeah, sure I have we, to. Yeah, uh, we see, we see uh, it's not expanded. Uh, there we are. Okay, that's fine. Thanks. Since there have been some technological hiccups, I didn't know whether I would manage this one myself. So uh, before I get into the core of the project, I'd like to provide a little background. So this, uh, what we call humanitarian circular exchange project was submitted as an idea competition originally last year, last September at the um, Climate Red uh, Summit, which is a Red Cross Red Crescent Movement Summit on Climate that uh, took place, uh, as I was saying, in September. Um, and you might see some Red Cross, Red Crescent traces still in the presentation here and there, uh, and that's the reason. Um, so we got special mention uh, of the jury, um, so it was myself and uh, Luis Cali, a former colleague from the Shelter Research Unit. Um, so the reason why we focused on the built environment uh, was both because um, of our own background as architects, urban designers, uh, with a strong interest on sustainability and the fact that material production is actually one of the highest green gas, uh, greenhouse gas emitters um, and it counts for 
45 uh, percent uh, of total uh, global green, greenhouse gas emissions uh, and then there is the, the other 55 percent is is uh, from energy as you as you know um, and um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, who is an organization promoting transition to a uh, circular economy, identified key, uh, five key uh, areas um, that, that make uh, a big part of this 45% I was talking about, and that being uh, steel, cement, uh, plastics, aluminium, and food production. Actually, food production is first uh, in the row. Um, so, but um, before uh, I would I would like before getting into uh, a small animation that I will show you on the project, uh, I would like to share a couple of uh, assumptions uh, that might be uh, uh, commonplace to some, but it's worth reminding. So, if we are to limit our uh, temperature increase to uh, plus one point five. Uh, degrees Celsius, and that has a, a huge impact on uh, reducing the biodiversity loss that we are uh, experiencing at the moment. We know that the total CO2 budget by uh, 2100 is of 50 billion tons of uh, CO2, uh, and at the current production rate, uh, if we apply the best available energy efficiency, uh, we are going to uh, emit 918 billion tons CO2, and if you are, if we are going to be uh, um, applying best uh, available energy efficiency and zero carbon energy, so uh, substitute renewables uh, for all energy production, we'll still hit 649 billion tons of CO2. So. That's to say business as usual is not affordable nor envisageable at the moment. Um, and uh, just to give an example, by 260, if we keep uh, at the current rate, uh, the, the construction sector, so the, the built environment will build across the world the equivalent of the city of Paris uh, every week. Uh, and that, of course, uh, it's something we can't uh, afford at the current with the current production methods. So it's like, doesn't mean that we don't need to build uh, for a growing population, uh, but we uh, need definitely to change uh, the approach. And here the uh, circular economy comes in with uh, its fundament fundaments, which is designing out waste, keep products and materials in use and regenerate uh, natural systems. Um, sorry, I just have to click on the other. Light. So we also know that um, we can't consider waste as such, so we have to start consider waste as nature does it, which means it doesn't exist, it just put back, it just put all the time back in the system. So uh, this little wheel on the, on the left shows the, the take, make, use, repair, reuse re and, and share, remanufacture and recycle kind of cycle, which uh, we need to um, move to towards uh, moving out of the linear economy, uh, uh, which is what is at the moment uh, currently used. So, and we also know that 40% of globally of, of municipal waste globally is made of construction waste, which is actually uh, valuable resources. So we have um, basically uh, um, wasted uh, 70, 80 years of production in, in, uh, in landfills that we uh, will have a very hard time recuperating uh, at any point in time. Um, so I'd like now to just go. Wait, I'll do it another way. It's loading slowly, sorry for my connection. Can you see the new screen now? Yes, just expand it as well, very good. Expand it, but I just wanted to make sure that, okay, let me know if you can't hear the sound. The humanitarian circular exchange, making space for maker spaces in the circular economy of post-disaster shelter and reconstruction. 
Let's take a look at the concept of the circular economy. What is it? It's best understood through looking at our current linear model of production, which has dominated the way we use resources in recent times. The linear economy involves taking, making, using and disposing, which depletes a finite supply of resources while generating waste. Around 50 billion tonnes are extracted each year of fossil energy, metals and minerals from the earth. Such resources are becoming increasingly difficult to extract, including essential resources for construction such as sand and gravel, which are scarce in supply, and the extraction of these resources is environmentally devastating, as are the widespread destructive impacts from waste in the natural environment. What's more, this energy-intensive model is responsible for a high level of greenhouse gas emissions from extraction and production processes. The construction sector alone consumes over half of global raw resources and a third of global energy use. 2.2 billion metric tons each year of building material waste is expected before 2025. 10 to 15 percent of building material is wasted in construction, and 54 percent of demolition materials are landfills. Most materials are unsuitable for reuse as they contain toxic elements. So what about the circular economy? The circular economy is an entirely different way of managing resources, based on the recovery of materials in production, distribution and consumption processes. Deriving maximum use value from goods and keeping materials in the loop through repair, reuse, remanufacture and recycling, this model minimises needs for extraction of new resources and eliminates waste as an element in the chain. Some general key principles include designing out waste and pollution, keeping products in use to repair, reuse and refurbish, and regenerating natural systems. So how does the circular economy relate to post-disaster contexts? There are two key areas we want to bring attention to here. The first is that of makerspaces. Makerspaces are small-scale fabrication workshops, which provide access to tools, resources and technical expertise to make and repair goods. They are gaining traction in the humanitarian sector as a way to empower communities to create and produce their own solutions to needs. Aid agencies are engaging with makerspaces as a way to locally manufacture supplies using local materials, saving time and costs of the international supply chains. The second area of focus is that of material reclamation for reuse. There exists a huge amount of waste material in post-disaster contexts, from collapsed buildings and infrastructure, which needs to be cleared away to make way for humanitarian assistance and reconstruction efforts. There is a great potential to reuse such materials in shelter and reconstruction. The environmental benefits of this would include reduced emissions, both from reusing material and from shorter distance transportation. Economically, this could mean saved costs and local income generation possibilities. Addressing the opportunity to realise greater circularity in these contexts is the humanitarian circular exchange. We see the potential for circular exchange of reusable waste material in post-disaster contexts and believe there is a gap for a humanitarian marketplace which links users' identified material needs with available waste material. Humanitarian makerspaces would act as hubs in this network, providing access to the necessary tools and knowledge to reuse local waste resources for reconstruction. It would link with and extend existing circular marketplaces, such as Greenstock and Enviromate, to adapt to a humanitarian context. Such a platform could attract donor funds and volunteer labour to specifically identify needs from a local level. The platform would be open to any range of users, from affected communities to local governments, allowing the registering of both available waste material and immediate material needs. With support from the platform, these will be registered to the database, an internal marketplace where users can browse and find materials uploaded locally in their area. The material exchanges will be processed via makerspaces, where there will be tools, technical support and knowledge sharing. The platform intends to attract donor funds to support material transactions and volunteer labour to match specifically identified needs with appropriate skill sets. This platform could have a number of potential benefits which amalgamate those of makerspaces and of material reuse and could lead to a locally engaged circular economy with promising local economic benefits as well as greatly reduced carbon emissions. Through specialist input, knowledge sharing and the adaption of makerspaces, 
These facilities could also assist in the integration of other circular construction principles into post-disaster shelter and reconstruction. But how do we get there? There is a need to address the shelter circularity gap. While there has been investigation into sustainability and recycled materials in shelter, there is yet no consolidated understanding of the opportunities, techniques, challenges and feasibility of different approaches to the circular economy in post-disaster shelter and reconstruction. Before being able to establish the humanitarian circular exchange, there is a need for a comprehensive understanding of the circular economy as applied to the reuse of construction materials. There also needs to be a greater understanding of the implication underlying the creation of humanitarian makerspaces, an essential step for equipping and adapting makerspaces to the needs of the processes involved. What might these other circularity opportunities in construction include? Additionally to material reuse, these principles could include designing for ease of repair and maintenance, designing for disassembly, material passports, and modular construction. The timeline foreseen for this project would begin with a thorough initial research stage lasting six months, working with academic partners to identify the circular economy opportunities in post-disaster shelter and reconstruction. This review would identify promising opportunities that are likely to deliver high environmental, livelihood and local economic benefits, and specifically focusing on the ability for outputs to be manufactured in humanitarian makerspaces. Stage 2 would occupy the following six months and would involve design, construction and the testing of prototypes around circular shelter and reconstruction strategies for makerspaces. Based on some of the most promising opportunities derived from the previous stage, specific physical shelter and reconstruction responses will be simulated and tested to gain better understanding of the practical and logistical implications of working at scale. The final stage of the project would involve the implementation of the research findings. This would first involve working with local organisations and partners, such as the National Societies of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement, to equip makerspaces for shelter. Finally, this project aims to establish and operationalise the humanitarian circular exchange, connecting the network of shelter-ready humanitarian makerspaces with the humanitarian sector, national societies and other governmental and non-governmental agencies. What is the foreseen impact of this project? We believe that this model could be a catalyst for a positive transition to a circular economy in post-disaster contexts and would have a number of positive impacts including capacity building through facilitating and supporting local production and knowledge sharing, economic, saving financial resources, creating income generating activities and attracting donor funding, environmental, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and reduction in pollution and minimise construction waste. So I think we can stop the titles here. Wait a second, we'll just try and get back to that. Um. Right. Oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, there we just are. Have concluding points uh, before uh, we can open to discussion if, if there is time for it. But um, at this stage, uh, we have uh, some ongoing academic collaborations uh, with two universities, Eta Hat Zurich, uh, that will look at the development of the digital platform that was explained uh, in the animation. Um, and um, and Warwick universities uh, with which we have uh, two ongoing um, thesis master thesis uh, on two separate uh, items. One is um, researching on maker spaces uh, and humanitarian shelters. So in terms of manufacturing or shelter shelters or shelter component parts uh, within humanitarian maker spaces. Um, we do have uh, ongoing discussion with the Fab, uh, Fab Lab Foundation and the Fab City um, uh, about uh, our project and uh, we have endorsements. So this is to have a better understanding of how actually maker spaces are set up uh, generally and uh, what kind of synergies they can attract uh, to uh, then deal with projects. 
um, and we um, have uh, started scoping uh, scoping study of what the private sector can provide us with. Of course, there is more research. I mean, in the in the animation that is mentioned made about the need for further research uh, to build up uh, the model that we will uh, then uh, try to. Um, to adapt really to, to structure according to some local uh, case studies that we are seeking to uh, set up uh, with the help of uh, operational organizations and to create collaborations locally. Uh, so there is a lot of knowledge in the construction industry about material passports, material banks, uh, life cycle analysis of different uh, materials um, and structures. And, and there is a lot that can be done through uh, artificial intelligence and computer visions, vision in terms of uh, materials looting after a disaster. So um, the idea is really to have a system that we can set up in preparedness phase, of course, to be able to respond then to uh, uh, disasters uh, at a later date, uh, so that the collaborations are set and uh, there is a, also structural logistic uh, capacity to, to do this. Um, and for the in-country field testing, we are looking at uh, hopefully setting up three uh, case studies in three different regions. Uh, and of course, every case study will be a different setup because the idea is really that is uh, the programs that uh, would be developed locally uh, are uh, not a kind of a stamped uh, repetition or copy paste of what has been decided internationally, but it's really uh, need based and need generated. So it's like what what a maker spaces locally would produce uh, and why will be determined that by the collaboration and the synergies between the different actors on the ground uh, that will be um, interested in the in this type of approach uh, from local communities, uh, international uh, humanitarian actors in countries, um, and then uh, there will be, I mean, maker spaces are the physical hubs where uh, this interaction will take place, but uh, there is also a humanitarian marketplace, marketplace which is digital and that will deal with the databases of um, materials and so on. Um, I, to put in perspective the project uh, and to, as a, as a summary before we enter discussion, um, I, I just, um, analyze the sustainability score uh, wheel uh, uh, and use that as a lens to uh, uh, highlight what the project uh, would be focusing on and uh, in terms of uh, the social uh, component part uh, it is about uh, fostering production, which is in part economical, of course, as well, but it's, uh, it's about knowledge sharing in the end and, and, uh, and uh, supporting a transition to circular economy, economies lo locally. Um, in terms of the environmental impact uh, is a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions uh, derived by the, the reuse of construction waste uh, and the reduction of uh, need for transportation. Uh, of materials as well, um, and uh, um, the reduction of pollution from material waste itself, which is if, if landfill uh, is uh, bound to cause uh, remarkable damage to, to habitats and ecosystems. Um, there is a cost uh, efficiency in all of this in terms of saving financial resources. Uh, this is a, is a global um, uh, global characteristic of, of circular economy approaches. Um, here we are looking at local income generation uh, through uh, linking people with uh, materials, but also providing uh, activities that, uh, I mean, uh, work that needs to be done, for, sorry, work that needs to be done. This is me clicking while I speak. Uh, work that needs to be done uh, by, uh, by a number of individuals uh, and, and organizations in order to put this in place. Um, and as well, if we think, if we set this in, an, in a response environment, uh, there is also the potential of attracting donors uh, for some specific initiatives. Um, so this is 
as a, a summary slide and I'm uh, I'm done with this. Uh, I don't know, Jorn, if there is a discussion now, there are other presentations on the line. So, uh, so uh, stop your sharing. Uh, and um, I would say that this is not a discussion. This is the future. Uh, our engagement in uh, how we can uh, achieve safe and sustainable uh, settlements in the years to come uh, will uh, kind of uh, define uh, the role we uh, we will be able to play in uh, managing the displacement. Uh, we see that um, we see, we see that the, the um, uh, increasing uh, urban nature of operations and uh, the um, and, and the challenges related to both climate change but also the overall sustainability demands us to uh, engage with a more holistic approach to the sustainability challenges and uh, uh, certainly as uh, Sina and Ida described, also to work on the overarching things. And that is really one of the major strengths of uh, CCCM, is to ge generate knowledge on the needs of people on the grassroots to inform the more overarching discussions and help policymakers and decision makers uh, act uh, according to the needs of the uh, affected populations. Uh, I think that we we will uh, probably have to invite everyone to uh, contribute uh, in the year to come on their um, perspectives on the uh, uh, on uh, the sustainability challenges uh, and I trust James and uh, Brian to come in with um, relevant uh, 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 relevant questions from the audience uh, but I would also like to see whether first of all I can stop sharing and then secondly if uh, we can challenge uh, our coordinators to um, to say that uh, it should be a clear ambition for CCM in the years to come to um, to work consistently on more sustainable solutions. That. Finally, stop sharing. Um, yeah, if people can put their questions into the chat, but um, something that popped into my head looking at Antonella's slides uh, on life cycle analysis, uh, the shelter cluster are, are working on uh, tools uh, for the shelter sector on the, the life cycle analysis of their materials. And uh, Juan and I had a call on with them a few weeks ago about it and we're kind of brainstorming in, in how we can kind of expand that to, to also uh, cover the kind of hardware element of, of CCM. So if, if any of you would like to uh, help on that or if you have any suggestions or ideas around it, um, just so we can kind of really start um, uh, factoring in the uh, li the life cycle costs of a lot of these materials that we're using as a, as a factor when we're putting together these projects and, and, and planning these programs. Over. Uh, yeah. Uh... James, uh, I thought uh, we, uh, <laughs> I, I kind of opened the floor for you to introduce Emmanuel, but ah. uh, if you would like to take the chance now, so. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I think I possibly am, um, there's a slight uh, <laughs> confusion, but no worries, I can introduce yeah. him. Uh, I would, uh, yeah, I would just say that uh, 
what we want the audience to do here now is to feed us with the ambitions and uh, your thoughts on where we should engage with regards to sustainability in the years to come, because then we will uh, include that in the work group uh, work streams and, uh, and we will for sure invite you to participate in the work group. So James, over to you. Okay, great. <laughs> Pretty on, um, because um, essentially I thought because he had a he had a bit of a presentation to also give us based on our program. Um, I thought if this was the point you'd come in, or was it to was it to have come in slightly earlier? But I just I was begging your indulgence on that so that I I know he has been waiting. <laughs> um, also the afternoon. So um, what do you propose? He can come in at this point. Please do. And okay, do you Manuel. want to share, Emmanuel? Yep, Emmanuel, you can share your presentation if you if you'd like. Please uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Yep, we can see it. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I was told I have only 10 minutes for this presentation and I'll try very much to, to stick to that uh, timeline. Uh, this presentation is going is taking over especially uh, essentially from where James left and uh, just uh, by way of introduction uh, is that uh, up to last year energy and environment were being considered as sort of standalone sectors and not very important at that ironically it had to take the covid pandemic to to really show uh, how both the environment and, and, and energy access uh, affect uh, the, the protection function of UNHCR in, in, in Uganda. And I, uh, an ironic observation is that uh, during the first lockdown in March uh, last year, environment and energy were were considered non-critical activities and were actually supposed to be to, to be to be taken off, but it's in a matter of weeks things had uh, had escalated to levels that no one had foreseen. For example, uh, food uh, nutrition was affected, uh, gender-based violence increased, and uh, quickly it was realized that these are two sectors that. Uh, cannot be separated from the protection uh, function of the UNHCR. So uh, Uganda is, uh, uh, has the highest refugee population in Africa. And uh, this, uh, this first slide uh, shows the operational context. Uh, from that map, you can see that uh, uh, there are refugee settlements literally from north north to south of the of, of the western half of the country and in all those uh, operation areas which is about in 12 to 14 districts uh, we are undertaking activities that that bring together livelihoods uh, improved energy access as well as uh, environmental restoration in UNHCR has this policy of do no harm so uh, this principle requires that uh, the presence of refugees should not bring undue harm to the environment in which they live. So we are doing a project called refugee forestation or reforest in short, and it tries to address the issues of uh, energy access because almost 100%, okay, between 70 to to 100% of refugees utilize biomass energy for cooking. Uh, but then this project is also looking at uh, uh, livelihood at, uh, aspects by promoting community tree planting. Among them is fruit trees, which uh, mature very quickly and they can use, they can use the, the harvested products either to make incomes or for for improved uh, nutrition. Uh, just some, uh, some uh, here you can see some of the pictures that are actually forest products 
are a source of livelihood in refugee settlements. You can see they are used for, for everything from uh, construction to energy and even uh, manufacture uh, production of uh, entertainment products. You can see at the bottom picture there, there is a group of refugees in one of the settlements in Uganda making musical instruments out of uh, local forest products. And it has actually been shown that in one of the forest, uh, in, in, in one of the refugee settlements, Changwali, which borders a, a forest called Bugoma, um, refugees actually make up to, on average, 90, uh, $90 annually from forest products. If you understand the economic uh, uh, status of Uganda, you will know that that's not a, a small sum. So since the arrival of refugees in Uganda, and Uganda has hosted refugees for so long, uh, Uganda has, uh, has experienced a lot of environmental degradation. And there are many drivers of this deforestation. But among them is uh, the harvesting of forest products for firewood and charcoal. These are both for, 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 for sale to make incomes, but also to to be used among the refugee households themselves. Uh, you can see that the figures we are talking about here are not small. We are talking about uh, almost 400,000 metric tons uh, per year of wood used in only one part of Uganda, the Southwest. That's quite significant. Uh, also, uh, in the last two years, uh, working together with the National Forest, uh, Forest Authority and uh, FAO, we've been trying to do analysis to see, uh, using remote sensing analysis, the impact of the refugee presence in, in, in some of the refugee settlements. And it has shown that there is a lot of uh, uh, degradation, and we, which brings laws of ecosystem services. Uh, uh, we've done this analysis within five to 15 kilometer radius from the, the settlements. And uh, on my right, you can see the impact. The, 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 the red areas show areas with, uh, that have shown significant uh, uh, degradation of the local vegetation since the arrival of the, the refugees. But an interesting finding is, uh, was that in some of the settlements, uh, it was found that uh, uh, more degradation actually occurs away from the settlements, which shows that uh, refugees are not the only uh, the, the, the only cause of forest degradation. However, this is not to say that uh, the refugees are uh, are not contributing to the deforestation. I, I, I have shown some of the 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 maps, the satellite images there that we have used in in Bugoma, which borders uh, Changwali. That is in the Midwest of uh, Uganda, bordering Lake Albert. Uh, there you can see uh, the, uh, the forest cover comparison between from 2013 to 2019. That is almost six years. And it's showing how intact forest has, uh, in, in, in a short span of time, uh, has degraded to almost zero coverage. And that is in the area that is uh, directly bordering the refugee settlement, which is shown to the, to, to, to the left. So either way, it's very important that uh, we need to protect the forest, but at the same time, we need to look at uh, how to meet these other uh, refugee needs. And so because of that, uh, in 2019, uh, UNHCR working together with the National Forest Authority decided to come up with a project called Reforest, Refugee Forestation Project. Uh, and that was in line with the uh, UNHCR's uh, overall objective of restoring uh, of the refugee response plan uh, with the broader objective of environment and natural resources protected and restored and the green livelihoods promoted using a catchment approach. So uh, the, the, the target in the long term is to, to restore 
up, up to about 10,000 hectares of degraded forest and refugee hosting areas. Uh, we are doing this by a combination of approaches, encouraging refugees to plant at least five trees, uh, but we are also encouraging uh, host communities to plant, but we are also working with the National Forest Authority to restore some gazetted uh, state forests that are found in, in, in these settlements. So the, the ultimate aim is that uh, the environment will be protected, but at the same time, refugees are able to meet their basic needs that, uh, that are usually obtained from the natural environment. Uh, this project has since now expanded and, and has now incorporated many other aspects. Uh, at the moment, we are piloting integrated settlement planning where uh, energy supply and uh, environmental protect conservation are key aspects of that integr integrated uh, settlement plan. Uh, so the strategy we, we, we had here was, first of all, uh, as I've said, working at settlement level, working with the host communities and working in the uh, central forest reserves. There's also a lot of uh, planning and coordination. We are bringing together local governments. We are bringing together different humanitarian uh, actors that are working in these settlements. But we are also uh, doing sustained advocacy through development partners. Uh, UNHCR has got very uh, few resources, but uh, tree growing as a concept uh, is a long-term activity and the impacts, uh, the positive impacts take time to be seen. And for that to happen, there's a lot of investment. So we are doing a lot of uh, advocacy uh, to make sure that these uh, UNHCR's activities are supplemented uh, by other donors. We have now formed a lot of strategic partnerships with the government, with the UN agencies, with the World Bank and other like-minded agencies. Uh, the implementation, as I've said, uh, uh, we, we started with the, the National Forest Authority uh, producing the planting materials. So collecting seeds, uh, raising seedlings, and this, the, the seedlings raised are based on consultations with the humanitarian actors as well as uh, the local governments to who provide us with a list of uh, the species that are suitable for, for, for each area. So there's a lot of consultation involved. We identify the, the tree species that they, they need. We identify the environmental problems that we need to address. And then we raise those seedlings. And then we also work with these various NGOs uh, at local level to do uh, extension services and also um, basically awareness creation, and they are the ones who actually do the, the distribution, taking the seedlings from the various nurseries that we have in all the, the refugee hosting uh, districts, and then taking them to the local communities. Uh, here, I'm, uh, I'm showing some of the, the, the areas where we have planted uh, before. We are also planting bamboo, which we expect that uh, in three years, it should be able to start meeting uh, the biomass requirements of uh, the refugees. To date, we have about 300 hectares that we have established, but it's an ongoing program. And as I've said, we are doing a lot of advocacy. So we are expecting that uh, uh, with the time we will have these plantations in every settlement so that uh, every, uh, all refugees can meet their requirements adequately. Uh, mapping, both for accountability to, to our donors and also for the purpose of follow-up, long-term follow-up, we, we do a lot of uh, mapping uh, of, of our activities. So on the screen is uh, a map of one of our intervention sites in the, in the West Nile region. Uh, that one is in Changwali. It shows again some of the 
our interventions between 2019 and 2020, we have not yet mapped what we uh, what, what we have done for this year because it's still ongoing. But we expect that if we if I do this presentation a year from now, we would see more maps with more intervention areas. And uh, just uh, some of the the key achievements we've done to date is that uh, we have. By the end of this year, we expect to have done more than 10 million uh, uh, seedlings planted. Already, we have done more than uh, 7 million between 2019 and 2013. Uh, there's a small table I've indicated there where we have done pl specific planting in state forests, uh, which totals to almost um, 600, if, if, if you add 522 and 50, it almost comes to 600 hectares. Uh, we are doing another additional 600 this year. So we expect that by the end of this year, we'll have done more than 1,000 hectares in addition to the millions that we are giving to the local communities to, to plant. Now, what are the next steps? Uh, the next steps, OK, starting now is that we are already in the first season of planting. But we are also planning for season two, which starts in September, uh, where we expect uh, 6 million seedlings to have been planted in, in the first season alone. But going forward uh, and realizing that uh, UNHCR does not have enough resources to undertake a massive tree planting, we intend to integrate uh, all our interventions with the other development partner interventions and uh, and government interventions so that uh, whatever we are doing can be integrated and in the long term we can actually hand over these interventions uh, for the long term uh, sustainability also uh, as a way of protecting the the, the environment is that uh, we we would like to establish uh, dedicated uh, fuel wood plantations in each settlement Already this year, we have uh, worked together with the Office of the Prime Minister, and they have given us more than 200 hectares in two settlements. And we are in the process of establishing fast growing uh, plantations there, which we expect uh, within five to six years should be ready for harvesting. And we will have a management plan uh, where they will be managed exclusively to meet uh, the refugee needs and uh, hopefully alleviate uh, their suffering in that respect. Uh, also, uh, as part of our activity, there are many other things we are doing through this project. We are participating in National Tree Planting Days. We are participating uh, in uh, a campaign that brings together corporate uh, bodies and uh, other government bodies called ROOTS. In full, it means running out of trees. Uh, UNHCR, as an organization, has committed to plant up to 1.5 million trees. That is a tree for each refugee uh, towards this root campaign. But we are also active in uh, Africa Climate Week, uh, especially when the, we expect to have a session on humanitarian energy. Uh, and we are also uh, strongly working together with the sector response plan to ensure that uh, our our plans are incorporated into that and uh, when resources are raised uh, we also have our long-term plans incorporated into them of course there are other international days like world environment day world refugee day and so on which again we are participating strongly in by supporting, pr providing tree planting material uh, to schools, institutions, and other humanitarian agencies. So uh, in conclusion, the, our next step is that uh, we understand that uh, the forests are fragile. They are very important for the well-being of the host community as well as the refugees. So it's not sustainable to continue relying on forests for energy. So in the long term, we are uh, promoting alternative energy. 
I have attached here a photo where we are having a demonstration of an ethanol stove. So going forward in the long term, we are asking, we are hoping that we can uh, we can stimulate movement away from uh, forest-based biomass uh, to other alternative sources of energy so that uh, we can protect our environments while also improving access to, to safe and affordable energy. So, and I've already said that uh, in the short term, we'll be doing uh, dedicated fuel load plantations that are supposed to elevate the, the problems of energy access in the refugee forests. And ultimately, we expect that we are going to move from uh, this situation where refugees are being blamed for environmental degradation to this one where our environment is back to its intact status. Thank you very much for your audience. Thanks a lot, Emmanuel. That was really interesting. And uh, I think uh, it kind of bridges uh, all the um, sessions of today because we have discussed the overarching areas. We have seen how understanding of the context and uh, the numbers uh, can um, enlighten us. And then we have gone into the some technical ideas on how we can support it. And uh, now you're bringing it together with the concrete actions in the field and the empirical examples of uh, some, uh, some uh, responses we may engage in. And, uh, uh, from my side, that is uh, the core point of uh, the sustainability approaches that we have to look at it in a holistic way. We have to see what uh, does it impact the social infrastructure in camps when we uh, implement physical infrastructure like uh, solar, like uh, water uh, treatment like uh, proper waste uh, systems and uh, all of these very interesting uh, setups that we may um, continue to engage in so uh, i've seen from the chat that a lot of interesting topics are coming up and i encourage you all to continue that and uh, be engaged in the um, in the work group on uh, clean energy, sustainability, and uh, connectivity. I also encourage you to come to tomorrow's uh, uh, session on uh, uh, strategic messages, because what we uh, do in uh, camp management should be what we're proud of and what we communicate that we do. Uh, so uh, we will be discussing things uh, that uh, wh where you can uh, see what the future of your engagement and uh, the pride you take in your work will be. So uh, log on to the CCM social medias and uh, start uh, tomorrow's session already now. But uh, I see on Charlie's face that uh, it's UK time for tea. So uh, we're handing over to Charlie now. Thanks a lot.